Amen. Well, we want to take time to get into the Word of God and to see what the Lord has for us. Just, again, so grateful just as He's been speaking to us through His Word. And so we want to pick up where we left off. We were talking from the book of Habakkuk, and we were talking about writing the vision and making it plain. And, and so we want to just review that a little bit and we had thrown these principles out and, you know, as we're looking to the Lord in these last days, we, we look on all sides. We know that the coming of the Lord is near and we believe it's nearer than when we first believed. Amen. Amen. You know, we, we look at the signs of the times and, and we look at evil men and seducers growing worse and worse. The church has become so contaminated with compromise and worldliness and worldly wisdom. And the standards have been brought low. We're being vexed by all the perversity that's in the world that the church is even embracing. And, and whether it's that to the chaos, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, we are in the last days, saints. And Jesus spoke those words, as long as I am in the world, I am what? The light of the world. And we need to be that light in this hour, in this community. Amen? We need to be shining that light of Jesus, that in the midst of this gross darkness, as we've looked through the prophecies of Isaiah, that light shines in the darkness. And here in Habakkuk chapter 2 was coming off the heels of chapter 1 where the prophet was pouring out his heart. In fact, he said in chapter 1 and verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And, and he was pouring out his heart to God because of the wickedness that was in the land. The, 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 in fact, the the enemy nations that were encroaching upon them, and he's crying out for God to deliver and rescue and save. There was an oppression in the land. And we are surrounded by great oppression. And many saints of God are falling under that oppression. If you have time, you could read this first chapter, but he was just talking about how the enemy, verse 5, the Chaldeans were coming. The Babylonian Empire was bulldozing the nations. And it was because of the sin that was amongst the people of God that now they were under siege and and, and, and he was crying out, God, where are you? If you don't save, we will not be saved. And so he poured out his heart and he said in chapter 2, verse 1, I'll stand on my watch, I'll set me upon my tower and I'll watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And when I look at that, it says, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that reads it. And so we've been taking some time that as God spoke to Hamblecook and as we're standing on the watchtower, we are standing at this hour and watching this generation deteriorate by the day. Wickedness on every side. Blasphemy like we've never seen before. It's getting worse and worse by the day. Murder and bloodshed and atrocities and sexual perversity and selfishness and rebellion and anarchy. And it's all the spirit of Antichrist that's moving in these last days. But somewhere in the midst of this is the true church of the living God. And I don't know about you, it is my endeavor not only to be part of that as we stand today, but I want to stay part of that church that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't care how evil and wicked it gets, the true church is going to stand in these last days. And when we look here and he stood upon his watchtower, 
We've been standing on this watchtower. We're talking about that, that secret place of the Most High, that prayer. And, you know, we know also that even as it said in verse chapter 1, verse 1, the burden of Habakkuk, the pro, which the prophet did see. Sometimes you would see like Malachi where it say the, the vision of the Lord, the vision of God. Sometimes it was the burden of the Lord. But it says this burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. He's seen this in the spirit realm. And we are seeing the oppressive powers of darkness, a church that has become compromised and polluted. But then there's the true church, the remnant of God, that God is raising up in these last days. And here we are as a people separated to God for the causes of his kingdom for such a time as this. Hallelujah. We are not here by accident. And we've been seeking the Lord. We've been crying out for this city, crying out for this neighborhood. We don't want to just remain in these four walls and thankful, yes, for what we have, the family of God we are, the love, the care one for another. But we know, as we've been studying recently, that divine mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and make disciples of all nations. I was sharing today as we were looking ahead at this outreach, we have got to enter into this with a burden in our heart that we will not walk away from this outreach with numbers and names of young adults and youth and kids that we are going to reach them long after the event. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. A burden for the souls that are so confused and lost and no one to lead them. And, and we look at that and it's kind of an environment that what was going on here. And Habakkuk poured out his heart, called on the name of the Lord, and, and he was going to listen to what God would say. And God said, write the vision and make it plain. And we've been talking about the vision of God for this ministry for this work that God brought us after those 15 years in Africa, 15 years in the streets of South Baltimore, peeling those souls off the streets and out of gutters and detoxes, and they were sending them from other states to us, and and judges releasing criminals to our care because the, the testimony of the ministry became that pronounced in that city. Churches from all different denominations would just bring them to us. And as we've seen it, you know, we, with that burden and that same vision, we launched out into Africa and launched out into India. But God has brought us to this place with a burden for this city, for this place, and in this hour. And he's called us together. As a people, no accident in his kingdoms. Each and every one of us with divine commission, you've been placed here by God. Amen. Either we believe the scriptures or we don't, that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Amen. God knew what you had need of. That's why he brought you through these doors. Amen. He knew what I had need of, and he brought me through these doors from Africa. Hallelujah. It's a long ways. Get one of those balls one time. Look at it. We're East Africa. It's a long way. You know, every time I'd go back for those years, and when you landed in Nairobi, I mean, the moment you get off that jet, I can smell the air. I can feel. Here goes. This is going to be a lot of chaos. It's going to be a lot of warfare, and you know you're going back to war for another year. People are going to die, literally. People are going to fall away. Thousands and thousands are going to be affected. Hundreds will be touched by, and, and, and saved into the kingdom, but all hell is going to oppose us. But you went anyhow, amen? amen. To live is Christ and to die is gain, amen? <laughs> you know, you just lay it all down, praise God. There's nothing worth more living for. You know, I was posting some pictures on our website. It had been a long time, and I said, let me dump a few more on there. And, you know, you got the picture of that Land Rover and, you know, was sitting at the police precinct after we hit that vehicle head-on doing about 50 miles an hour. And it's like a, 
uh, uh, one of those 1950s dump trucks that hit us head on just as we were going into one of the most witchcraft ridden places and, and disease AIDS ridden places in, 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 in all of Africa and to CI and North Nyanza and we'd been preaching in Bondo and we had preached in Asenge to the tarmac the, 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 the pavement was melting beneath our feet I remember Mama Karen, she went out and bought all the team a baseball cap. It was so, she didn't know what she could do for them, so she bought them all a baseball cap, just a little bit of shade to make it through. But we were literally, it was like the tire was just, it was that hot. It was just like, like glue coming off our feet. And we preached and we worshiped and led souls to Jesus. And we preached and, and led souls to Jesus and praised and preached. And, let, and we just kept doing it all day long till there was nothing left. Hallelujah. And I can remember, and, and yet that which drove us was that sense of the hour that we're on and I believe God is putting that burden in our hearts for the souls in this neighborhood you know when I read that statistic today <laughs> and you look at that small percentage that will come to know Jesus and you know you don't need to really go too far to know how true it is and when we see what Habakkuk said, write the vision. This is what God spoke. Write that vision and make it plain so we can take it and be those royal couriers and, and take it and give it to others. You know, one of the things that Habakkuk would go on and cry out in chapter 3 in the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, it says in verse 2, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. The fear of God struck me. And he said, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of years. And in the midst of your years, make known and in wrath remember your mercy. I wonder if that could become our prayer. Revive your work in the midst of this chaos. Babylon is coming. Judgment is, is at the door. The nations are being bulldozed by the powers of darkness. And it's coming our way. And God, you are our only hope. Revive your work in the midst of all of this. Hallelujah. That cry of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Hallelujah. Can there be a cry in our hearts for God's presence and power to come down in this place that that love of Jesus will emanate out of our being, that the presence of God will emanate from us when we encounter people, they'll be touched of God to want to know what is the presence that's in us? What is it that's in us? Would to God that we could see that presence emanate from us. I've shared the testimonies. I can remember years ago when we had just gotten married. It's, you know, like 40 years ago. And I, I can remember I was just, there was no work in the city. The economy was absolutely collapsed. All the steel factories and, you know, the Bethlehem Steel and U.S. Steel. And it's affecting Ford and Chevy. And the economy was just a disaster. And, I mean, we were dirt poor, you know. Just barely surviving, you know. We were back there and someone was asking me about pancakes the other day and reminded me of my love for pancakes, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you, pancakes was one of the cheapest things that you could survive. And I would go out sometimes with 30 bucks to do the shopping for the family for the week and just, God, give me wisdom, you know. And so, you know, you had the bologna for the kids and, you know, you had the tomato soup for Mama Karen with some crackers and, and I just kind of chose the pancakes, you know. And, and you had them for breakfast and you had them for supper, hallelujah. And the only other thing you had was all that stuff they'd throw at the dumpster in rich products where they'd send me to. And they'd say, you could take as many as you can carry in your pockets, preacher. <laughs> but I can just remember just the poverty that we were in and just, just surviving just off a... Of, I mean, just off of so little, and times where there was literally nothing left. 
It's kind of cool. The other day I found a few pictures and uh, it was the, the church that we had in our home. And uh, Brother Jeff was there and he was lean and mean, just young man full of the Holy Ghost. And we were seeking God. Brother Jimmy's dad was there and a few others, Brother Charles. And But I can just remember in those days and... You know, because we'd, they'd send us out, and so you'd have to get up like 4.30 in the morning, and it's just brutal cold, you know, two, th- two feet of snow on the ground, and just get up and, you know, just get on that bus. I'd spend some time in prayer before I'd drink a, a, a cup of watered-down coffee or tea. You know, most of the time couldn't afford coffee, and so just be drinking that, get on that bus, get on the 6B, head towards downtown, and get off of there and just walk across downtown, wind blowing, just walking through those empty parking lots, and get down there on, on Tupper and Franklin, the SPS, the rent bum service, and then you just get in this little room and just smoke, you could barely see across the room, you know. And just sit there for hours just hoping that they'd call your name. And then, you know, I had the odds stacked against me. Oh, he sent me to the worst jobs because he was ashamed of me because he knew wherever I go, I'm going to preach Jesus and I'm going to be carrying that Bible, you know. So he always sent me to the scrub jobs. I mean, the worst of the worst. And uh, that first day, he said, give me that book. So I didn't know what he was saying, so I, I gave him my Bible. And then uh, he put it on his file cabinet. And it's like, you can't take that on the job. Well, next day, man, that baby's in the pocket. You ain't getting it today, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but I can remember, and you'd pray for hours. And, and I can remember from there, you'd get on the bus and get a bus to the place after you waited two hours praying and reading the scriptures and sharing Jesus and praying. And then you get on the bus and pray some more. And then I'd get to there and then you'd get on the job and you'd have a break and I'd pray and read some more. And then you get lunch. I didn't have no food. Pray and read some more. And after a while, you're just so full of the Holy Ghost that God would move. I mean, if you can't get full of the presence of God after all that prayer, something is seriously wrong with you. You You couldn't but help but get in the Holy Ghost. You didn't have no money. You couldn't eat. You couldn't drink coffee. You couldn't. You just, I remember they'd even give you, besides your break, they'd give you a bathroom break. I'd go in there to just, you know, sit on top of the toilet and read some more. Hallelujah. And I can remember just some of the visitations of God. I can remember walking down that hall and that elderly man worked there so many years and he would be, he's pushing that metal dumpster and he's pushing it and he's he's getting closer and I'm just looking and I'm just in the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden as I got close, he let go of it and he walked and he's coming towards me looking at him and I'm walking and I'm I'm just in the spirit and he just falls on his knees shaking and just cries out pray for me I'm lost and just sat there and knelt down beside him and prayed for him to receive the Lord Jesus into his heart and he just started weeping and cried out to God sitting there in the middle of lunch hour and these guys are just trash talking and just stand up and it says, excuse me, everyone. Okay, no one has prayed and thank God for our food. I had my little cup of coffee. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are maker of heaven and earth. Thank you that all things were made by you and for you. And just pray and they're all just looking, trying to talk at first. Finally, they all just kind of come low. And we thank you for this food in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. (laughs) Another time I'm sitting there and God says, I want you to read that out loud, what you're reading. I'm reading the great white throne judgment. God tells me, I want you to read it to the whole lunchroom. These are hardcore factory workers. I don't know what was in that room, 40, 50 of them at that time. I stand up and I said, excuse me, everyone, I've got something to share with you. The Lord has told me to read this and, and just read. And I saw the, 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 a great white throne and the, and the living and the dead, the small and the great, stood before God. And, and I began to just read that passage from whom all the earth and heaven and earth fled from it. Just, 
but the presence and the power of God that would manifest. And I'm believing that we would see that presence. You know, when the first church moved, the Bible says that they were laying the sick in the street that just the shadow of Peter would heal them. When Stephen preached to those, those religious people that persecuted him, and, and it says that his face just shone like an angel. And I would to God in this hour that, that as we're pressing into God, as we're divesting ourselves more and more of our earthly encumbrances. I don't know if you heard that prophetic utterance last week, but... It's stuck in my heart and in my spirit. This is no time to be encumbered, looking back and encumbered with the affairs of this life. He's coming. His coming is at hand. Lay aside the sin and weights. And I'm just believing as Habakkuk got this vision and as he shared it and, and when he heard it, he just cried out to the Lord, if, if this is what you're going to do, Lord, that that you've spoken, I, Lord, revive your work in the midst of yours. May, maybe you've lost a little ground. May, maybe, maybe you've had a season where you really walked in that kind of boldness. Hallelujah. That one night where they sent us out to that factory, and I don't know where it was. It was the middle of the night, just way out there. I don't know. It was in Boston Hills. It was a canning factory of stream beans, man. And all I know is there are big cans just pushing them in that heat. It was like just huge carts of them, you know, and just totally spent, I mean, wiped out. And I remember just sharing the Lord as much as I could. And we got done, and it's probably 3 or 4 in the morning, and we're in the parking lot waiting for that cheese bus to show up to pick us up. And you're just, of course, you're with criminals, drunkards, you're with the lowest of the low. That's who's taking these jobs, okay? And I'm just out there, and I'm with uh, you know, my brother Gary, fellow servant of the Lord. And we get out there. He looks at me. I look at him. He says, we got to preach to him. I said, I know. I said, what do you got? He pulls out two tracks in his pocket. I said, man, I only got one left. So we got three checks. We're totally spent. We're dead tired. But there's this mass about 60, 70 people there. We got to preach to them. So I went up and started sharing Jesus with these two guys. And next thing, this guy starts looking over his shoulder. And the next thing, this guy, oh, I don't believe all that. Two more come because they hear him yapping. And then three more come. And, and I, next thing I know, I didn't even notice in there, but Brother Gary just pulled back and just started praying within himself in the Holy Spirit and, and begin to preach and begin to share what happened at the cross and share the gospel. And before you know it, there's like 70 people just, just fixed listening and, and just knew that I had to just, it was the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to end this thing because that bus is going to show up any minute, you know. And just stopped and said, I want to, if your heart want to see, you want to surrender your heart to Jesus right now, we can pray and you just pray. And so we prayed and this whole crowd of guys just praying, man, I mean, thugs, drunkards, addicts, man, the whole nine yards, man, this is, <laughs> and you're just sitting there with like 60 guys somewhere in Boston Hills with about these guys just, and the vast, I don't know, it's probably 80, 90% of them just prayed that prayer. Hallelujah. And I said, in Jesus' name we pray, and, brrr, and the bus pulls up. Hallelujah. <laughs> and just the timing of the Lord. It was like you scripted it all, you know. <laughs> it was like a movie, you know, and it just pulled right up and kind of opened the door. Get on, guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, of course, you're just praising God all the way home. No, we still ain't done. Got preaching some more in the back of the bus. And there was one man, I don't know what was up with him. He was like full of demons. And at one point, he just shouts and just flips out a switchblade. And just, he's right across from me. So I'm on the end seat. Brother Gary's on the middle seat. He's right here. And he puts that switchblade right to my throat here. And he says, preacher, you say one more word. I'm going to slice your throat, throw you out this window, and no one will ever know you. And I just looked at him, and I said, I looked at him and I said, 
The Bible says not to cast pearls before swine. And don't give that which is holy to the dogs. And I said, but one thing you can rest assured, my friend, that I will never deny my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when I began to talk, there was like a hush, everything. It was like dead silence on the bus because I didn't know what was going to happen. And this guy was definitely crazy, you know, and he was very capable. You know? <laughs> it was great just talking to Brother Gary afterwards. He was saying, Pastor, man, I'm telling you, my brother, when you when he started saying, I said, we are in trouble now because he is not going to shut up, you know. So he started searching his heart. Lord, forgive us of our sins if there's anything because <laughs> we're surely going down right now and have mercy on us for anything. We failed you, Lord. Receive us to glory. And that's the kind of prayer he's praying, you know, just this. This looks like this is going to be it, Lord. We preached many meetings together, but I think we've come to our end. And that hush hit the bus and I spoke those words. And got done, and we just worshiped the Lord and sang, He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead. I would to God, that zeal, that boldness would, maybe, maybe God hasn't given you graces to, to be that evangelist that we would see in the scriptures. Maybe, Maybe the gifts and the graces in your life are more prominent in other areas. But there must be that burden and that desire and that zeal. Lord, just revive your work in the midst of days. Lord, I want that fire to burn in my heart. Amen? Don't you want that fire to burn in you? And, and, and when we see this and, and, and we look here and we... We, 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 we see that the prophet here has been given that vision. So we've been talking about that vision for souls. You know, when you read in this, uh, this chapter of what was going on, it kind of reminded me of the, the same condition that was in the book of Joel. And when he said, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm, Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, on my holy mountain because judgment was at the door there. That was the northern kingdom. But it was interesting because when that burden came to Joel, he said in chapter 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethiel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell your children and your children another generation that that which the palmer worm hath left has the locust eaten. And what the locust has left, the canker worm hath eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. And then he begins to talk in verse 6, For a nation has come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion, and laid my vine waste. And it was just talking about the judgment of the Lord that was falling. But what he was saying is, tell your children, have you ever seen anything like this? That what was left to... That Palmer word didn't eat, which was a symbol of the curse. They were an agricultural society. It was their livelihood that what it didn't eat, then the, then the, uh, the what the locust left, the, the, the Palmer worm left, the locust ate, and what the locust left, the, the, the canker worm is eaten, and what the canker worm, uh, worm is uh, left, the caterpillar is eaten. And it was just like unbelievable. We've never seen nothing like it. Saints, have we ever seen such wickedness in the land like we're seeing? And it's getting worse and worse by the day. And so when he, when he said in this chapter, he said in chapter 2 and verse 1, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, and we don't have time. We could get lost there from verse 12 on down. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great in kindness, and repents him of the evil, or grieves him, and he, for who knows if he will return and and, and repent and pull back his wrath and leave a blessing behind him. 
and a sacrifice to be offered to him. And so what we're seeing here is seek God with all your heart. I mean, we can look at what's going on and just say, it's lost, it's finished, it's done, it's a sinking ship. And in the natural it is, but there is a remnant of God he has called us to reach. There is a people that are sheep that have been driven away and that have wandered from mountaintop to hilltop, we read, and and have forgotten their resting place, that God's going to bring them through these doors. And there's souls that are out there, the souls of these children, and and we want to tell it to our children, look, this is what's going on in the land. This is the powers of Satan. This is the results of sin and rebellion. I just kind of went through my mind as I thought about the 60s and the early 70s of everything that was going on in the nation. And a good number of us, you weren't in that time. But, you know, what looked like this, this, this protest for peace and freedom and this anti-war movement and the chaos of what was going on in Vietnam and, and then the drugs and the, that led to more anarchy and rebellion. You look back and you can just see that everything that was sought out to get, which was freedom and, and liberty, just turned into bondage and captivity to satanic powers. Amen. Chained, and now it's every form of perversion and sexual perversion and, and, and you know, people, kids calling themselves girls and girls calling themselves boys and and sex changes and all sorts of things that the scripture so plainly reveal as as an abomination and confusion in the eyes of God. And we could go into many things, just the selfness of man and uh, uh, the... The, the, the murder, the violence, the, the callous condition of our conscience. We look at it all. And, and I don't know about you, but as we were talking about that vision, when we seen what happened in Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came out of the captivity to rebuild the temple of God. And we read of Nehemiah when he heard of the reproach that was there, even after the temple was built, that he was so grieved by it that he, he, the king thought he was sick. And he wept and he fasted and he prayed. And whether it was Ezra that had divine favor to go back and build the temple or Nehemiah to go rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, God has given us that vision. A vision to rebuild in the midst of this rubble. A vision as we were reading in Nehemiah when he came and circled those walls and and as he looked at it and and seeing what was there, and then he began to share with the elders and the nobles what God had put in his heart and the favor he found from the king to come and rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, the temple. And we kind of went from there of what we're trying to do is build a vision. You know, what we've seen in Nehemiah, and you can turn there, in chapter 4, was something that was very prominent in our thinking is they began to build and it was beautiful because as he shared the ver- the the vision with the people and and the and the wasted condition it was in and in verse 20 of chapter 2 he said then answer I them and said unto them the God of heaven he will prosper us therefore we as servants will arise and build but you have no portion. And he was talking to their enemies, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and, and Gershom, and, and as they were laughing and mocking at them. And there were some that would look at us and mock and say, what is this work going to do? They said, you know, a fox can jump on that wall and it'll fall over. 
And they mocked them and scoffed at them and scorned them. But they said, listen, the God of heaven, he'll prosper us. And I say by God, the God of heaven will prosper us. Can somebody say amen? amen. <laughs> we came in here with nothing. And when, the, when, when even the, the mission's base just said, we'll support you, and we want to, you know, until you can get that work going, and God convicted my heart, and I said, no. If God is in it, God will sustain it. God will raise it up. And if it's not, then we don't want it. If God ordained it, God will build it. Can somebody say amen? Amen. <laughs> And so we just lived with just, I mean, it was coming from all sides, man. We, no, okay. We lived off of little, but we trusted God. And we feared the Lord. And people that are sitting in this room made great sacrifices. And day in and day out and week in and week out, when we could see nothing believing, that God can out of the ashes and the rubble and out of our littleness raise something up. Hallelujah. I shared that testimony of how God gave us this building right before all this building surge. This building would have been twice as much as what we paid for it and the properties as well. There's three properties. And I shared how God just, we, by God's grace, we prayed, we believed, we trusted. We, we lived off a little, but we thank God for what we have. Having food and raiment, we're content. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, I hear people crying about how bad and how much they're struggling. Do you got food? Yes. Do you got clothes? Praise God. Are you in a mud hut? You're doing good. Hallelujah. You're not. Okay. <laughs> And whether I can go back to the mud huts that we lived in, to literally just sleeping in the vehicle, on top of the vehicle, it was so hot in CI. I mean, Usenge. I mean, they gave us the beautiful room, but it was right next to the kitchen where they cooked all day to give us that lovely meal of mutumbo. You ever eat mutumbo with ugali? You haven't eaten mutumbo. It's pretty much just cow intestines, you know, boiled until you got that nice sheen of grease on the top. It's very sweet pasta, <laughs> very sweet. <laughs> and that sheet of grease of Mutumbo, you know, you could see the chunks with the tentacles from the intestines just, you know, just emanating from it and just hallelujah. Whatever they set before you, you eat with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> And thank God for it. Glory to God. And it was so hot in there, I tried to pretend I could sleep, and I couldn't do it. Mama Karen did. I just went out there. Man, I cleared some stands. I did get after our guy who was supposed to be the watchman and sleeping in the vehicle because he was so spent. I moved the speaker stands. I moved the amplifier stand, cleared a space, and got on that uh, plywood on top of the roof of that Land Rover and just crashed out there. And I remember I woke up with this pounding headache because I didn't realize I fell asleep right next to the gas can and it was open. And all I did is smell gas all night, you know. <laughs> but the watchman slept through it all, so that was interesting. But we, we made it through. And, but having food and raiment, let's be content. And, and you know, when I, I look back at those 15 years and where we went, or whether it was in Baltimore when we took everything and God had blessed us from going from nothing here, and God told us, go to Baltimore and start a work, and started in that little dump of a storefront, and, 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 and labored and worked, and go right from the boatyard to there to preach, and sometimes filthy, dirty, and just, you know, just, just trying to raise up a work out of nothing, and Till finally I knew this thing ain't going to take off. you got to do this full time. Those that preach the gospel got to live of the gospel. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I put for sale. God had blessed us with a nice home. We had a car uh, through good, you know, by his wisdom, we paid it off. A motorcycle had and just time to sell it all. Hallelujah. And just went and moved into the shell of a building that God made a way for. Wake up in the morning just... 
on the floor. I'd be hugging the floor because it had these glass blocks. It had no windows on the building, just these glass blocks, you know. And it would be so hot in there that it was just like you were in a Ziploc bag you were sleeping in. That's what it felt like. And I'd find myself just on the floor because it was just like two degrees cooler down there. But I can remember those days, and whether it was that or Mama Karen of those first couple of weeks when we were trying to get the plumbing working and we're using the corner bar for the bathroom, you know, got the karaoke going on, drunk as a skunk, and you're going to wash your face and brush your teeth or whatever. <laughs> and just thank God for women of God that could follow me, whether it was the Ganges River or the bush of Uganda. Hallelujah. You ought to appreciate what you got. What a saint of God that would follow me all around the world, live in those conditions. And I say by God, in 40 years, that woman has never complained one day of our married life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I look at where God brought us from and through, and, 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 and you look at where we are, and God blessed us, and and we sacrificed and we labored and some of you came and others came and 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 you know it was like when I got here and I was trying to get my license and it was like it took me like a couple weeks to get my license and I didn't know what was going on and finally the lady in the high office she said pastor you got to understand you are like you've been out of this country so long it's like you died you are not in the system it's like you don't exist it's the equivalent of like you you're dead Okay. Well, I said, I'm here. Okay. It is my birth certificate, you know, and it's the real deal. Corpus Christi. There it is. That's where I was. You know, my birth certificate was issued from and by and by, we finally did get it. No credit, no recognition of anything, but by the mercies and grace of God, we paid for it with cash. Hallelujah. By a people that sacrifice, that had a vision, that had a heart, and it was something here and something there, and someone got blessed here, and someone got blessed there, and someone got blessed in their business, and, 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 uh, and, and, and a fire came, and, and we got like thousands of, a few thousand dollars that just came, and we did most of the work all ourselves, Holly, and we put every penny of it in there, and, and accidents would happen, and and, and money came, and it came from all different directions. And it may seem like a little thing, but let me tell you something I've found about walking with God. It's not how big it is or how, or, or how much money it is. It's what has come supernaturally. Hallelujah. What's come by the power of God. Hallelujah. What came by faith. That the God who creates out of nothing raised this up out of the dust. And I'm telling you by God, as you are standing here today, there are souls out there that just as you came through these doors, God wants to bring them through these doors. And he wants to make a testimony out of your life. He wants your face to shine as an angel. He wants your shadow to heal people. He wants your sacrifices and hoping against hope that God can make a way. Hallelujah. You, and out of the rubbish, he can perform miracles of his grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I could go on. I could tell you stories from now to next year of miracles of what I've seen in Africa, what I've seen in Baltimore. We see miracle after miracle. God just supernaturally providing and making a way. And what I see here is Nehemiah is in the midst of the rubbish. And though these are mocking and, and it seems as a thing of nothing, but in the midst of this that... Uh, we've seen what took place is that Eliashib, chapter 3 and verse 1, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate and sanctified it and the doors. The priests started first. The leadership. In fact, you can see the same principle in Ezra chapter 3. The same thing when they came to build the temple. And the first thing they did, chapter 3 and verse 1, is that the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Saints. 
If we're going to get anything together, we got to come together like one person. This outreach, you know, some cried, it's too close, man. That's too much work to do. Uh, boy, you know, we just had an outreach and saints, Jesus is coming. The time is short, hallelujah. We are well able. We can take the land, praise God. We've got the grace. we got the, the ability. We've got the Holy Ghost. We can't waste any time. Now's the time. This is the moment, praise God. This is the time for us to rise up again as one man. Amen. Hallelujah. And the priests were first. The leaders. How many of us have been in Churches where we laid men with burdens, but won't lift their little finger, Jesus said of the Pharisees, the hypocrites. They can bring doctrine, but when it comes to a life of sacrifice, pouring into the flock, and counseling people, helping the people that no one's got time for. People don't care. People don't, you know, they just don't have time for all that. We, the church has become a big referral agency. You know, I was just one day I was in prayer and I looked across the street and I'm looking at, you know, that glass and it's just all these papers, a big referral place, you know, <laughs> Genesis, Genesis. Uh, it's the Genesis of tell you where to go, but not here. Okay, <laughs> A big referral. Aid, and that's what a lot of the church has become. Go to mental health, go to spectrum. Go downtown, go here, go do this, go, you can get help here, you can get help there. I don't want to be a referral agency. We want to bring that gospel that comes in power, hallelujah, that he's anointed us with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those that have been crushed, hallelujah, to proclaim the recovering of sight to the blind and to proclaim that year of jubilee, hallelujah, to his people. I don't want to be a referral agency. And we may not have silver and gold, as Peter and John said. But what I have, hallelujah, I give to you. And in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. And you pray that prayer of faith. Glory to God. And God moves. And so when we're looking at this, the, the leaders set forth the vision. But then as you watch what happened is that they all followed suit. You know, it was interested in verse 3, they set the altar upon his bases for fear was upon them because of the people of the countries and they offered burnt offerings unto the Lord, even burnt offerings from morning to evening. We are surrounded by enemies, man. First thing we got to build is the altar for the sacrifice for our sins because right now if we ain't God, we are finished. And I'll tell you one thing. If we ever lose the presence and the anointing of God, we are finished. We are just another church in the directory of the lukewarm, of that which is just dead religion, form of godliness that denies the power thereof, that brings no true freedom and deliverance to the oppressed of this generation. Amen. I don't want to just be another. We got churches from one end of the city to the other, but no power. No message from on high by and large. Not a word from above. Not the true power and presence and glory of God. And what these people knew is if we're going to pull this off, we got to be pure before God. Who is he that's going to dwell on my holy hill? Who's going to send to my tabernacle but he that has clean hands and a pure heart? Hallelujah who's not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully. Now let me tell you, not just one or two. Look at the children of Israel going into the promised land and they whooped up there on Jericho by the power of God. God just made those walls to fall. And then they come the little Ai, just this little, they just sent a small battalion out there and they got whooped. Joshua fell on his face, something's wrong. And the captain of the Lord host told him, stand on your feet, okay? Not time to pray, it's time to purify. There's sin in the camp. 
And they call them one by one until they found and found where the sin is in the camp. But it wasn't it interesting that sin in the camp affected the whole camp. Your life affects many. We can bring leaven into this place. We can bring corruption. We can bring a grieving of the Holy Spirit of God. Now listen, we are all battling with sin every day of our life, okay? And if your halo's still on there, well, just let it be knocked off by the Holy Ghost and be honest with yourself. We are warring with the flesh. We're warring with unbelief. We're warring with fears. We're warring with discouragement. You're warring in one area or another. We are all at war daily. Amen. And we come short. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I know in my flesh dwells no good thing. And, and we're warring within with the flesh. We're warring with the powers of darkness and the spirit of the world without. But bless God, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Hallelujah. And I don't care what you go through and how much you stumble or fall. Get up. Hallelujah. Amen. Plead the blood of Jesus, not frivolously, not to go back to sin, but to rise up and say, Lord, have mercy. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. I can acknowledge my transgressions. I confess my sins. My sin is ever before me. Help me to hate what you hate. Love what you love. Search me. Try me. Know me, God, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we're going to deal with sin. We're going to deal with failure, but we just keep pressing in. And when I seen that they built the altar first, so let me, let me put a few things out. You have an example. We have not come here to lay you with burdens. We have been everywhere from in the rafters to on the roof to, to under the vehicles to in the toilets to in the pots and pans, whatever it takes, out on the streets, whatever it takes to, to live by that example before you, to, to present ourselves and say, as the Apostle Paul said, be followers of me uh, as I am also a follower of Christ. We've given you an example. And so what happened then that as they, we go back to Nehemiah 3 and we're going to begin to wind up. But what was happening is they, as they began to, Eliashib, the high priest, verse 1, they build it and, and sanctify that. And then it says next to them, the other men begin to build. And the scripture tells us here and it shows us that every one of them begins to build and everyone according to their families. If you ever want to do a, an interesting study, you know, read at the end of the book of Numbers and chapter 1 and then the first part of chapter 2. But it was interesting because when God had established Israel and, and now is there preparing to take them through the wilderness and the building of a, the tabernacle of Moses and and as he's setting them forth, he set them all forth according to their families, according to their standards, their tribes and their peoples. And, and each one, the scripture says in Numbers chapter 1, that it says that in verse 32, those which were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers, all of those were numbered of the camps. And he Gave the number there, over 600,000, and the Levites were not numbered among them as, they, as the Lord commanded Moses. And, and the children of Israel did according to all the Lord commanded, and Moses, uh, according to as Moses uh, was commanded. And, and so they pitched by their standards and they set forward every one after their families according to the house of their fathers. And then he begins and he goes and he, and he names some of the, you know, as you, as you look in chapter 1 where he said the children of Israel, they, 
In verse 52, they pitched their tents, every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout the host. The standard was like a flag and it had an insignia. And there was those 12 tribes of Israel and each one was made up of clans. But all I wanted you to see here is every man by his own standard throughout their house and they did just as they were commanded. Chapter 2, verse 2, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house far off about the tabernacle of the congregation. When you go in and read it, you'll find that three tribes were on the east, three on the west, three on the north, and three on the south, and everything faced the tabernacle. Let me tell you, if we're going to build this and rise up as one man, our lives need to all be facing the center of our lives is the tabernacle, the sanctuary of God. This is not a hobby. I like my first pastor. He used to always preach that Christianity is not a religion. It is a way of life. Hallelujah. There's a lot of people that their Christianity is like a, a moral hobby. It makes them feel good. It appeases their conscience, makes them feel good about themselves. They build up their religious knowledge, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Talk is cheap. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And, and you got so much of that religion, but all of these face the tabernacle, and everyone was according to the standard. And, and when you look in Nehemiah 3, that's exactly what took place. Everyone was on the wall according to their families. And from this section to that section was this family. And from that section to that section was the family. Read it. It's really interesting to read through chapter 3 of Nehemiah. And it, and it tells of, of how they all went through this and, and everyone according to their family. And you get there in the chapter 4 and we'll end here. But as the enemies see it began to come to pass and heard verse 1 that we were building the wall they moved with they were angry and moved with indignation let me tell you something as we enter in towards this outreach get ready for trials get ready for the enemy to come get ready for temptations and struggles and not just for the outreach how many have been going through some battles in your life the last number of weeks or months the enemy comes to, to try to steal the word. He brings tribulation, persecution, and affliction. He comes for the word's sake. He wants to rip it from your heart so that you can, he'll wither the life of God in you. And he wants you to give up and quit or just become that nominal fake Christianity, that other gospel that's throughout this land. And what we see here is they were angry and they mocked the Jews and they begin to call them feeble. And, and so as, as it goes on, we don't have time. They made their prayer to their God in verse 9 and they set a watch against them day and night because of them. And, and they were getting discouraged in verse 10. And sometimes we're going to get discouraged and they became aware that their enemy was planning to see, besiege them, to rush upon them and overthrow them in the work. So they got a plan and they set people in the lower and the higher places, verse 13, and, and even set the people according to their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. So the workers were according to their families. There was other families that they were watchmen. There was others that had a weapon in one hand and, and a tool in the other hand. But everyone according to their families. And he says, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And we're going to close there today. But what we see is, the vision came to that leader, and whether it was Habakkuk in his generation, whether it was Joel in his generation, whether it was Ezra in his generation or Nehemiah, God raises up a visionary. 
And Nehemiah came and spied out the land and the, and the broken down walls. He shared it with the people. And the people said, let us rise and build. And as we go on and see, the, the scripture even tells us that these people, they had a mind to work. Hallelujah. They had a mind to work. These were a people that set themselves to it and everyone according to their family. And so when we see this, he said, fight for your brethren, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your homes. And we say, Pastor, I ain't got a wife. Well, you're fighting for one because who knows what God will do in this place. Who knows what God will raise up? Godly marriages, godly kids, and everything we, we built, and whether it was in Baltimore or in Kenya or Uganda or Tanzania or India, it was all raising up a people, and, and those people reproduced after that vision and, and marriages and children and leaders. I was listening to some of the testimonies in Africa. Right now in Africa, those churches, those leaders we trained, and some of them were children, are now pastors and deacons. And, and what they're doing now is they're sending out their own missionaries. They're taking missions from the stronger churches, are sending out missions teams to go help the weaker and hold crusades and reach into new areas. Can you say praise God? Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When there's a need, they rise up. God's been moving in power and signs and wonders. And, and, I, and I would just say that that's what we're fighting for. And everyone according to their family. So the leaders set forth the vision, but then the work is built by all the people of God. The work was not built by the leaders. It was built by the people, every man according to their family. Everyone, as we read in Numbers, according to the standard, whatever battalion they were a part of, whatever clan and tribe they were a part of, that's where they were to go to war with. And if we're going to accomplish this great task, we've got to rise up as one man. We've got to make sure that altar is intact, that our hearts are clean before God, that the presence of the Lord will go before us. Amen? Amen. You know, some of us are busy helping out, getting ready for the preparations. Hey, let me, it begins in here first. You know, if you're lowing as we go, do we got to do another outreach? Can we do it? How are we going to do it? You know, we're all going to die. It's not going to happen. It's all going to be a flop. Whatever the thoughts and reasonings and imaginations are, it starts in our own hearts. Let's have clean hands. Amen. Let's have a pure heart. Let's not go up except the presence of God go before us. Amen. We need to rid the idols. We need to rid the, the, the besetting sins. We need to clean up our hearts. We, we cannot go to battle without the presence going before us or we'll be just like Ai. And so here we are as a people. And the prophet of God says, fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons and daughters. You know, at Ezra, when he launched out to build that, that tabernacle, it says they came to the river of Hava, and it says they, they called for a fast, and they said they began to seek a right way for us and our little ones. And I believe that's what we're doing. We've got a burden for, for the kids of this community, for the little ones, for our kids, and to see an army raised raised up in this place and, and 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 as i look out at what's going on and what we're facing in this hour and and what he said in ezra 8 21 i proclaim the fast at the river ahava that we might afflict or humble ourselves before god to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all of our substance he said, because I was ashamed to ask of the king, the heathen, for their help. We don't need the heathen's help. We don't need their loans. We don't need uh, government money and grants and loans. All we need is the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And let me tell you also, he can save by many or he can save by few. 
And I believe what God is raising up in this place is David's mighty men. Hallelujah. I like those 400 warriors of David. Hallelujah. Those were some bad dudes, man. You remember even when there was the, the, the Absalom was trying to steal the kingdom and, and he had the council of Ahithophel and, and Absalom stealing the kingdom and he says, whatever you do, man, don't stir up David's mighty men, man. No, you don't want to mess with those boys. Don't make those guys mad. <laughs> I like how that was just injected. Even the wicked understood, don't mess with David's mighty men. And I believe God is raising up those mighty men in this place mighty women of God in this place that'll love not our lives unto death father we ask in the name of Jesus that you would take these words and as we're calling that fast at our river as we're seeking a right way and humbling ourselves and seeking a right way for us and for our little ones and all of our substance Lord we don't want to lose this divine inheritance we don't want to lose your glory and your presence and we're just asking Lord that Father, as we fight for the souls of this community, as we launch out to evangelize and in this outreach, Lord, that you would use us as a people, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our hands, purify our pursuit, O oh God. Lord, if you don't go before us, we're not going. We can't go without your presence. And so, Father, we're just asking that you would put within us that fight lord we've rebuilt the altar first lord where they would offer the sacrifice for sins and to keep that fellowship lord with you those peace offerings lord those sin offerings and father with it lord we know we're surrounded by enemies on every side and so father we ask in the name of jesus she would strengthen our hands for war. Help us to see that you're with us, Lord. That you go before us. And Father God, we're praying for a harvest of souls. Give us a harvest. Rend the heavens and come down. Revive your work in the midst of days. Bring a revival to this place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're asking for it, Father. Oh, I want to encourage us, saints, as we're here this evening. I want you to be praying these next number of days. I can remember as we launched out, we seen a revival in Eldoret when we began that work in East Africa that became the basin where, the, where, where, where it became the base of operations in East Africa. And, and I can remember the move of God. I posted a picture online and it was just at the altar and you could just see the young kids, 12, 10, 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, crying out to God, weeping, asking to be filled with the Holy Ghost. When I looked at that picture, it smote my heart. I remember the one time we were in the office and it was a cement walled building we were renting at the first and was this, you could hear this roar that was just going like a hum that was a roar going on. And I asked the deacon, what is it? What's going on? He said, let me go check. He came back five minutes later. He said, pastor, it's the youth. They've been hearing your teaching on the baptism and the Holy Spirit and they just, they're, they're crying out to be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and the kids are are praying over each other and 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 the one girl she was about you know six foot two and 250 she got filled with the Holy Ghost the power of God hit her she landed one on one of these plastic chairs the leg went flying cracked it right off the chair hit the floor and the and the kids were rejoicing and praising God and just praying over each other instead of going to eat lunch I can remember we'd go out in the marketplace to preach the gospel. I remember there in front of the post office preaching the word and I'm, and I'm looking out there and I mean seeing three of those young person looking at that elderly man with a cane sharing Jesus and praying with them and leading them to the kingdom of God to be born again. I want to see that revival again. Just an outpouring. 
a young adults group, about 50 of them, the fire of God that was in them, a zeal and a purity and a, a commitment to one another in the vision. What could God do if we could see 50 young adults in this city, not just in a religious gathering in one of the big box churches, but I mean really sold out for Jesus? What might God do? Hallelujah. Father, just give us that heart to pray and to believe that you're able to pour out your spirit on all flesh. Lord, that you would be glorified. Do your work, we pray. Make us vessels of honor fit for your use. In Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that, say amen and give them praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, thank you, Lord. We're going to close out the service. We thank God for all of you that have joined on YouTube or the call-in. Just know that the saints of God are lifting you up. We take whatever your needs are to heart. We're praying for you, all of you that are missing, those of you that are sick or afflicted, those that are unable to attend. You are not alone in the fight. You are in our hearts and our prayers. Please communicate anything more specific we can pray for. Make it known. And the sanctuary saints are praying for you, both near and afar off, wherever you may be. We thank God for you. We speak God's peace, his healing power, and the rest that remains to the people of God. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for all of our family.